My husband wasn't interested in me because I wasn't attractive enough for him, but I later found out that he was gay and had been cheating on me with his male best friend. I exposed him in front of everyone. I'm a 30-year-old woman, and I've been married to Stephen, 35, for four years now. We live with his family, and our marriage has been anything but happy. When we first met, Stephen seemed like the perfect guy. He was charming, successful, and came from a good family. We dated for a year before getting married, and during that time, everything seemed great. But as soon as we tied the knot, things started to change. On our wedding night, Stephen barely touched me. He said he was tired from the festivities, which I understood. But as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, intimacy became a rare occurrence. When I tried to initiate, he'd often push me away or make excuses. About six months into our marriage, Stephen dropped a bombshell. He told me that my body wasn't really his type and that he didn't find me attractive. I was devastated. I asked him why he married me if he felt that way, and he said he thought he could learn to be attracted to me over time. This revelation crushed my self-esteem. I started dieting obsessively and even considered plastic surgery, thinking it might make him want me. But nothing changed. Our intimacy issues persisted and Stephen seemed more and more distant. Living with his family only made things worse. They're very traditional and place a lot of importance on having children. As our marriage went on without any sign of pregnancy, they started making snide comments about my fertility. At first, it was just subtle hints. Stephen's mother would ask when we were planning to start a family, or his aunt would recommend some herbal remedy to boost fertility. But as time went on, the comments became more direct and hurtful. I remember one family dinner where Stephen's grandmother outright asked me if there was something wrong with me. She said it wasn't natural for a healthy young couple to be childless after two years of marriage. I was humiliated and left the table in tears. Stephen never defended me during these incidents. He'd just sit there silently, letting his family berate me. When I confronted him about it later, he'd shrug it off, saying they were just concerned about continuing the family line. I've asked Stephen multiple times to visit a fertility clinic with me. I figured we could get checked out together and see if there were any issues on either side. But he always brushes off my requests, saying we don't need doctors interfering in our personal life. His refusal to get checked has only fueled his family's belief that I'm the problem. They've started treating me like I'm defective and it's affecting my mental health. I feel isolated and alone in this house, with no one to turn to. As our marriage deteriorated, I noticed Stephen spending more and more time with his best friend, Robbie, 32. At first, I was glad Stephen had someone to confide in, thinking maybe it would help him work through whatever issues were causing problems in our marriage. But then I started noticing some strange patterns. Stephen would often cancel plans with me to hang out with Robbie. He'd stay out all night partying with him, coming home at dawn smelling of alcohol and cigarettes. When I'd ask where he'd been, he'd get defensive and accuse me of not trusting him. Stephen started spending more nights at Robbie's house than our own. He'd say he was too drunk to drive home or that they'd lost track of time playing video games. Once, he was gone for three days straight. When he finally came home, he acted like it was no big deal and got angry when I expressed my worry and frustration. Their friendship seemed to go beyond normal boundaries. They'd plan shopping trips together, spending hours picking out clothes and accessories. Stephen never wanted to shop with me, claiming he hated it. But suddenly, he was eager to spend entire weekends at the mall with Robbie. They even started planning vacations together, just the two of them. When I asked if I could join, Stephen would make excuses about it being a guy's trip or say that three would be a crowd. I felt increasingly pushed out of my own marriage. The physical affection between Stephen and Robbie also raised red flags for me. Their hugs lingered a bit too long, and they seemed overly tactile with each other. I'd catch them sitting unnecessarily close on the couch or playfully wrestling in ways that seemed more intimate than platonic. Once I walked in on them in our kitchen, Robbie had his arm around Stephen's waist and they jumped apart when they saw me. Stephen laughed it off, saying I was being paranoid, but the image stuck with me. Another time we were at a family barbecue, and I saw Robbie feeding Stephen a bite of his burger. It was such an intimate gesture, and the look they shared made me feel like I was intruding on a private moment between lovers. Despite all these red flags, I tried to convince myself I was overreacting. Stephen was my husband, after all. He'd chosen to marry me, but doubt continued to gnaw at me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to their relationship than met the eye. As our fourth wedding anniversary approached, I hoped it might be a chance to reconnect and work on our marriage. I planned a special dinner at home, bought new lingerie, and even wrote Stephen a heartfelt letter expressing my love and desire to make things work. The day of our anniversary arrived, and Stephen didn't even mention it. He left for work without a word, and as evening approached, he didn't come home. I called and texted him repeatedly, but he didn't respond. Hours passed, and I grew increasingly upset and angry. Finally, around midnight, I decided I'd had enough. I knew where he was likely to be, so I got in my car and drove to Robbie's house, determined to confront my husband and bring him home. Little did I know, that night would change everything. First update. When I arrived at Robbie's house, I was surprised to find the front door slightly ajar. As I approached, I could hear music playing softly from inside. I called out, but no one answered. An uneasy feeling settled in my stomach as I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The living room was a mess. Empty beer bottles and half-eaten plates of food were scattered everywhere. Clothes were strewn about haphazardly, including what looked like Stephen's favorite shirt draped over a chair. I made my way through the house, calling out for Stephen and Robbie. As I approached the bedroom, I heard muffled voices and laughter. My heart was pounding as I pushed open the door. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. 
Stephen and Robbie were in bed together, naked and entwined. They didn't notice me at first, too caught up in each other. When they finally saw me standing there, the look of shock and guilt on their faces said it all. I stood there, completely numb. It was like time had stopped. All the suspicions, all the doubts I'd been having suddenly crystallized into this awful reality. My husband, the man I'd given four years of my life to, was cheating on me with his best friend. Stephen scrambled out of bed, frantically trying to cover himself. He started stammering out excuses, saying it wasn't what it looked like, that they were drunk and things had gotten out of hand. But I could see the lie in his eyes. Robbie just sat there, silent and pale. He looked more annoyed at being caught than sorry for what he'd done. In that moment, I hated him more than I'd ever hated anyone in my life. As the initial shock wore off, anger started to set in. I wanted to scream, to throw things, to make them feel even a fraction of the pain I was feeling, but I couldn't find my voice. I just stood there, trembling. With rage and hurt, Stephen approached me, reaching out as if to touch me. I flinched away from him and he stopped. Then he and Robbie started begging me not to tell anyone. They said it would ruin their lives, their careers, their relationships with family and friends. I couldn't believe the audacity. They had just shattered my world and all they cared about was protecting themselves. It was like I wasn't even a person to them, just an inconvenience to be managed. In that moment, I made a decision. Without saying a word, I turned and walked out of the room. I could hear Stephen calling after me, but I didn't stop. I got in my car and drove to my friend Sarah's house. Sarah had been my best friend since college, and she was the only person I felt I could turn to. When I showed up at her door in the middle of the night, crying and barely coherent, she didn't ask questions. She just hugged me and let me in. I spent the next week at Sarah's place, barely eating or sleeping. My phone was flooded with messages and missed calls from Stephen, his family, and even Robbie, but I couldn't bring myself to respond to any of them. During that week, I did a lot of thinking. I replayed every moment of my marriage, seeing all the signs I'd missed or ignored. I thought about all the times Stephen had made me feel small, unattractive, and unwanted. I realized how much of myself I'd lost trying to be the wife he wanted. I also thought about why Stephen had married me in the first place. If he was gay, or at least attracted to men, why go through with our wedding? Was it all just a cover? Had I been nothing more than a convenient beard for him? The more I thought about it, the angrier I became. Stephen hadn't just cheated on me. He'd stolen years of my life. He'd let me believe there was something wrong with me, that I wasn't attractive or fertile enough, when the whole time he was the one living a lie. As the initial shock wore off, I started to form a plan. I knew I couldn't just let this go. Stephen and Robbie didn't deserve to keep their secret, not after what they'd put me through. And I deserved the chance to reclaim my life and my self-esteem. With Sarah's help, I started gathering evidence. We combed through my phone and social media, looking for any suspicious messages or posts from Stephen or Robbie. We found quite a few that, in hindsight, were pretty damning. We also started tracking their movements. Sarah would drive by Robbie's house or Stephen's workplace, noting when they were together and taking photos when possible. It felt a bit like we were private investigators, and under different circumstances, it might have even been fun. After a week of silence, I finally responded to Stephen's messages. I told him I needed more time to think and that I'd be in touch when I was ready. This seemed to calm him down, and he stopped bombarding me with calls and texts. Little did he know, I was just biding my time, gathering the strength and the evidence I needed to blow his carefully constructed life wide open. Second update, it's been six months since that fateful night at Robbie's house, and my life has completely transformed. I wanted to give you all an update on what's happened since then. After spending a week at Sarah's house, I put my plan into action. Sarah and I had collected quite a bit of evidence of Stephen and Robbie's affair. We had photos of them together in compromising situations, screenshots of flirty text exchanges, and even a video of them kissing in a bar parking lot. I compiled all of this evidence into a single folder. Then, on a Sunday afternoon when I knew Stephen's entire family would be together for their weekly lunch, I posted everything to the family group chat. I included a brief message explaining what I had discovered and that I would be filing for divorce. The response was immediate and chaotic. My phone exploded with messages and calls. Stephen's family, who had always looked down on me, were suddenly full of apologies and offers of support. It was almost laughable how quickly they turned on Stephen once they realized he was the one at fault. Stephen, of course, was furious. He called me every name in the book, accused me of ruining his life, and threatened to sue me for defamation. But I had truth on my side, and I wasn't backing down. I also posted the evidence on social media, tagging mutual friends and colleagues. It might seem petty, but after years of being made to feel small and worthless, it felt incredibly empowering to finally take control of the narrative. The fallout was significant. Stephen lost his job when his conservative employers found out about the affair. Many of his friends distanced themselves from him. His family, while not completely cutting him off, were clearly ashamed and disappointed. Robbie didn't fare much better. Last I heard, he had moved to another city to try and start over. As for me, I filed for divorce immediately. Given the circumstances, it was a fairly straightforward process. Stephen didn't contest anything, probably hoping to get it over with as quickly and quietly as possible. The divorce was finalized three months ago, and I've never felt freer. It's like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. I no longer have to pretend to be someone I'm not or try to win the approval of people who never really accepted me. I've moved out of the city, found a new job, and started rebuilding my life on my own terms.
My self-esteem, which had been at rock bottom for so long, is slowly but surely improving. I've started therapy to work through the trauma of my marriage and the affair, and it's been incredibly helpful. An unexpected but welcome development in all of this has been reconnecting with my old boyfriend, Mark. We dated in college but drifted apart after graduation. He reached out to me after hearing about my divorce, offering support and friendship. At first, I was hesitant. The last thing I wanted was to jump into another relationship. But Mark has been incredibly patient and understanding. We started off just talking, catching up on each other's lives. Slowly, those feelings I had for him in college started to resurface. We've been dating for about a month now, and it's been wonderful. Mark treats me with respect and genuine affection. He makes me feel attractive and valued, something I never really felt with Steven. It's still early days, but I'm cautiously optimistic about where this might lead. Looking back, I don't regret exposing Steven and Robbie's affair. Some people have criticized me for it, saying I should have handled things more privately. But after years of being lied to and made to feel inadequate, I felt I had the right to reclaim my narrative. I know now that I wasn't the problem in my marriage. I wasn't unattractive or unlovable. The problem was Steven's inability to be honest with himself and with me. While I wouldn't wish the pain I went through on anyone, I'm grateful for the strength and self-awareness I've gained from this experience. To anyone out there who might be in a similar situation, wondering if they're crazy for suspecting their partner of cheating, I want to say this. Trust your instincts. You deserve honesty, respect, and genuine love. Don't let anyone make you feel less than worthy. As for me, I'm excited about this new chapter in my life. For the first time in years, I feel hopeful about the future. I'm rediscovering who I am outside of being Steven's wife, and I like the person I'm becoming. Whatever happens with Mark, I know that I'll be okay. I'm stronger now, and I won't settle for anything less than the love and respect I deserve.